All right, hello and welcome. I'm Elizabeth Angel. I'm the ERI uh, Communications and Program Manager. Thank you for joining us for the Seismic Design Process for New Buildings, the second in a series of training webinars created by the Applied Technology Council and FEMA and supported by the Student Leadership Council here at ERI, which is bringing this presentation to you. ERI is the leading nonprofit membership organization connecting professionals and researchers from a wide range of disciplines are working to reduce to um, create earthquake resilience in the United States and around the globe. Um, thank you for joining us for this. If you'd like to find out more about ERI, you can visit our website or I'll talk briefly about the benefits of becoming a member at the end of this training. I'm going to hand it over now to members of our Student Leadership Council, our co-presidents, Khalid Saifullah. And Ahmed Hassan, I guess, sorry, Ahmed isn't with us today. So Halid, I will turn it over to you to introduce um, the other people speaking today and our presenter. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. H hello, everyone. My name is uh, Khalid Saifullah. And uh, on behalf of uh, Student Leadership Council of EERI, I would like to welcome you all on this webinar on seismic design process of new buildings. Uh, we would like to thank uh, ADC and FEMA for making this webinar happen. And uh, uh, with that, I would uh, uh, like uh, Gigi from ADC and uh, Patia from FEMA to introduce uh, themselves. And these are actually the personnel who are uh, making this training happen. So uh, over to you, Gigi. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Gigi Rojan. On behalf of the Applied Technology Council, I'd like to welcome you to the second part in this webinar series on FEMA P749 Earthquake Resistant Design Concepts. An introduction to the seismic provisions for new buildings. We hope you got a chance to attend last year's webinar on part A, um, but if you haven't, please check out the recording. Today's webinar will present part B of the FEMA P749 report, which covers the seismic design process for new buildings. The training material for this webinar was recently developed by the Applied Technology Council under a contract with FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And it's the first time we'll be delivering it for a live audience. Therefore, we would greatly appreciate any feedback you may have to improve the training material and please look out for a post webinar survey sent to your email within the next week. The training materials are drawn from the new edition of the FEMA P749 report, which expands upon and updates the previous edition to the most up to date seismic provisions. The new FEMA P749 edition will be coming out later this year, so please keep your, ear, your eyes open for the report in the next months and make sure to download it once it's available. Now I'd like to turn it over to Patia Scott, who will provide a brief introduction to today's webinar. Patia is a civil engineer at FEMA's Earthquake and Wind Programs Branch and is the project officer overseeing the training development, as well as the new edition of the FEMA P749 report. Patia, please go ahead. Thanks, Gigi. Um, again, my name is Patia Scott and I'm with FEMA. And as part of our responsibilities at FEMA under the, North, the National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program, we support activities to reduce future earthquake losses. And the primary way we do this is through the development and publication of technical design and construction guidance products, as well as through the support and training and related outreach efforts, such as this training. FEMA supported and worked with the Applied Technology Council to develop this training course to provide a tool that communities and other entities could use to encourage greater protection from earthquake hazards, thereby reducing future earthquake losses. Understanding the basis for the seismic reg regulations in the nation's building codes and standards is important for design professional students, building owners and operators, and many others. So we hope you enjoy part B of this webinar. Thanks. Katya, um, now I'd like to introduce our fantastic instructor today. Um, so Ron Hamburger has nearly 50 years of structural and earthquake engineering experience, including design, um, earthquake and failure investigation, construction, research, teaching, and development of design guidelines and building code provisions. Since 2011, he has served as chair of the ASC 7 Committee on Minimum Design Loads and Associated Criteria for Buildings and Other Structures. He has chaired the BSSC Provisions Update Committee from 2000 to 2009 and chaired the joint USGS BSSC Project 17 panel that developed the basis for the seismic design maps contained in ASC 722. Over the course of his career, he has personally investigated the effects of 10 major earthquakes and authored papers on their implications for earthquake resistant design. Ron is a lead developer of this training and is the lead author on the update of the FEMA P749 report. So with that, Ron, please go ahead. Thank you, Gigi, and hello, everyone. I understand we have viewers from all over the world uh, with us today. 
Uh, I actually happen to be located in Oregon in the United States, and so for me it's morning, so I'll say good morning, uh, but also good afternoon and good evening to you all, depending on where you are. I'll start to share my screen here, and we will get started. Okay. Uh, as said by Gigi and Pattaya uh, this morning, we're going to be presenting part B of FEMA P749, uh, which is a more technically oriented part of the document intended for design, young design professionals early in their careers who know something about earthquake engineering but would like to know more. And this part in particular goes through the seismic design requirements in the International Building Code and more specifically, the ASCE 7 standard. The FEMA P749 document, uh, as said earlier, is just about to be published uh, as a second edition. The previous edition was done some 10 years ago. It provides an introduction to US building regulation processes as it relates to seismic safety and sustainability. And it's broadly written for two general audiences. The first of these are the general public and part A, uh, which many of you may have attended training for last week, uh, is focused on this general public audience, uh, people who do not have a detailed technical understanding of earthquakes or how they affect buildings. And the intent of that part A was largely to give an introduction uh, into how in the United States uh, we regulate building construction uh, and attempt to provide desired performance in the buildings that we design and construct. The second part B, uh, is targeted at design professionals, including engineers, architects, students, and others who want a detailed introduction into the design requirements of current building codes. Uh, in part A, if you attended last week, we talked generally about earthquakes and their effects, the building development process, the concept of acceptable risk upon which our building codes are based, the concept of resilient design, something that is new uh, and since the hurricanes uh, in the last few years have become a topic of great interest uh, among building regulators and will likely result in some very major changes to the building codes in the future. Talk about the building codes we have today uh, and common structural types and their vulnerabilities. One of the things that EERI is known for is its learning from earthquakes program. Uh, partnering with FEMA over the past 30 or more years, EERI has sent investigators to major earthquakes around the world, and I've been fortunate to be one of those investigators many times. Uh, and what I and other investigators have seen when we've looked at the damage from earthquakes is certain types of buildings tend to behave in specific ways. And when I talk about a type of building, I'm not necessarily talking about the occupancy but rather the form of construction. Uh, and so last week, if you attended, you heard about what some of the common vulnerabilities of different types of construction are. And that carries over into today's talk because the building code requirements for structural design of buildings and other structures is very much wrapped around how different types of structures perform in earthquakes. And there are specific criteria in the building code uh, for the different types of structural systems based largely on the types of failures that we've seen in past earthquakes. The topics I'll be covering today in part B include structural dynamics, design ground motions, seismic design categories, structural design criteria, non-structural component design criteria, and a few special topics. If you attended last week uh, and listened to the training on part A, what you learned, we hope, are the key elements of building seismic safety are understanding earthquake hazards and soil conditions at the building site, the importance of building code adoption by communities and enforcement for good building seismic performance and to protect the public safety. Considerations of community resilience to natural disasters using resilient design approaches. St 
structural design elements for good building seismic performance. And these include load path, configuration, ductile detailing, non-structural component detailing, and understanding how different types of building structure types perform in earthquakes and following specific design requirements to make sure that they perform adequately. Today, I'm going to be giving you an introduction to the requirements of the ASCE 722's seismic design procedures. ASCE 722 was published just a few months ago. The International Code Council uh, voted a few weeks ago to adopt ASCE 722 as the basis for seismic design requirements of the 2024 edition of the International Building Code. Presently, the International Building Code, as adopted by most communities around the United States, adopts the ASCE 716 edition. And there are some important differences in the seismic design requirements between ASCE 722 and ASCE 716 uh, that those of you who are familiar with 716, I'm hoping will be eager to learn about. I will point these out as we go through the presentation today. Uh, the specific topics I'll be talking about are, first of all, an, introductory, an introduction to structural dynamics. Seismic, the, the way earthquakes affect structures is a dynamic, dynamic phenomenon. And you can't really understand how to design for earthquake resistance unless you have a rudimentary understanding of structural dynamics. And so I'll be giving you a very short course this morning in structural dynamics and how it's used by the building code to help us design structures. Then we'll be talking about determining seismic design ground motions, risk and seismic design categories, uh, the structural design criteria, basically chapter 12 of ASCE 7, non-structural design criteria, basically chapter 13, and then as I said earlier, a few special topics. You'll be seeing this slide a number of times throughout the presentation. Uh, it shows the basic steps in the seismic design process under AESCE 7. It starts with determining the building's risk category based on its use and occupancy. Uh, then, based on where the building is located and the types of soil conditions that are present, determining the de design ground shaking level. Determining the building's seismic design category based on the ground shaking level and its risk category. Selecting an appropriate seismic force resisting system, designing the seismic force resisting system, considering the effects of any structural irregularities, if there are any present, and then designing the non structural components in the building. And I'm going to walk through the seismic design process in exactly this order. First, we'd like to do a poll to understand where, who you all are and what your knowledge is. So if we could bring up the first poll, please. Okay, and the first poll question was, what level of experience do you consider yourself with regard to seismic engineering and seismic design? It looks like most of you have at least some understanding of seismic design. Uh, hopefully, you will not find the materials I'm presenting this morning to be at too basic a level. All right. Um, the first part of this talk, as I said, is going to be about structural dynamics probably material that all of you have seen many times in your studies. Uh, this first slide here shows what we call a linear single degree of freedom structure. And really, all of the building code requirements in ASCE 7 are built around the concept of the structural response of a single degree of freedom system structure, like this one, to earthquake shaking. As you're, uh, I'm sure, sure aware, uh, for a linear or elastic single degree of freedom system such as this one, if you apply a force F to the mass in the structure, it's going to, to displace in the direction of the force an amount X. And if you apply a force that is twice that amount, 
it'll deflect in the direction of that force two times what it would have under the single force F. And then if you take the force off of the structure, it will return to its at rest position. That is the definition of linear structural response, either static or dynamic. This slide here shows that same single degree of freedom linear structure uh, that is pushed to the side and then displaced. And when that happens, the structure vibrates. And if you were to do a plot of the displacement of the structure versus time, you would see something that looks like this upper graph here. And you would see that the structure undergoes sinusoidal motion. Uh, the structure that I just had in that little video was what we call an undamped structure. And an undamped structure, if you displace it and release it and let it vibrate, it will vibrate forever. The fact is there are, are no structures that are perfectly undamped. All structures have some amount of damping. Damping is a form of energy dissipation that occurs due to friction, uh, due to minor cracking that occurs, uh, due to the behavior of real buildings and structures, when they vibrate back and forth, there are different sources that leach away some of the energy of the vibration. And in a damp structure, rather than vibrating forever, uh, as shown in the lower graph here, uh, with time, the amplitude of vibration will slowly dampen out uh, and eventually come to a stop. The most important parameter in designing a structure for earthquake resistance is its period of response. Uh, the period of response is formally defined as the amount of time in seconds or fractions of a second that the structure, when in free vibration, will undergo one complete cycle of motion. Shown here on this slide, I'm showing that cycle of motion as being from the first zero crossing of the structure uh, in its vibration back through a peak motion in one direction, a second zero crossing, peak motion in the other direction, and back to it, its initial at rest position. There's a very simple formula for determining the fundamental period of a structure. It's given by two pi, the square root of the structure's mass divided by its stiffness. And because we typically think of structure's mass in terms of their weight, that can also be represented by 2 pi times the square root of the structure's weight divided by its stiffness and the acceleration due to gravity, g. These graphs here uh, show a structure with the same period but different levels of damping and how the damping affects its response. Uh, in fact, when a structure has damping, this does tend to affect its structural period a bit. However, this is a small effect, and we typically ignore this when we're doing structural design. We tend to represent damping in seismic design as a fraction of the structure's damping relative to its critical damping. The critical damping shown over on the graph in the right is that amount of damping that would just allow a structure to come to rest without doing any oscillation. So it's the smallest amount of damping at which the structure when displaced will come to rest without oscillating. We tend to describe the amount of damping present in a structure by the fraction of the damping present in the structure relative to that which would produce critical damping. In the building code, Except for special cases, we typically assume that structures have about 5% of critical damping. And in fact, we represent ground motion in the building code, assuming that the structure's response is controlled by 5% of critical damping. Again, we're looking at our single degree of freedom system structure here, uh, subjected to a ground motion underneath the cartoon of the structure. And on the right is a plot of the displacement of the structure to that ground motion that you see over on the left. By the way, if you're interested in what that ground motion happens to be, it is the 1940 El Centro earthquake, which occurred in Southern California. 
The equation beneath the plot on the right is the equation of motion for a structure, any structure, responding to earthquake shaking. And what it says is that the mass times the acceleration of the structure relative to its base, plus the acceleration of the ground given by U double dot of T, plus C, the damping coefficient times the velocity of the structure relative to its base, plus the stiffness of the structure, uh, times the displacement of the structure relative to its base at any instant of time equals zero. And in order to determine uh, what the response of the structure is as represented by the graph above the equation, you can go through a process of numerical integration uh, in which you go time step by time step and solve this equation uh, and determine what the displacement is at each instant of time. Once you know what the displacement is, you can determine the force in the structure uh, based on the stiffness of the structure times the displacement. That equation uh, is pretty difficult to solve. In fact, you typically need a computer to do it. Uh, but lots of folks have solved that equation for lots of ground motions. And what you're looking at here are three plots of the response of structures, single degree of freedom structures, having different fundamental periods, one second on the left, two seconds in the middle, four seconds on the right, all to that same 1940 El Centro ground motion. Uh, and what you can see when you look at the response of these three different structures to that same ground motion is that each of the structures tends to respond at its fundamental period of response. So if you look at the middle graph here, you can see that that structure is basically vibrating back and forth at a two second period. And the structure on the right is basically vibrating back and forth at a four second period. Uh, the structure on the left at a, at a one second period. And it's basically like the earthquake kicks the base of the structure uh, and then the structure vibrates at its natural period. Uh, and then the ground motion kicks it again and vibrates some more. So observation of this type of response allowed earthquake engineers to develop the concept of response spectrum. This graph that you see here is the response spectra for, again, that 1940 El Centro earthquake ground motion. Uh, and the way this graph has been created is basically people have done analyses of structures having single degree of freedom structures having different natural periods ranging from zero seconds all the way out to five seconds. And then they've simply plotted the maximum acceleration that the structure has experienced as a function of the period of the structure. Uh, and this is the primary tool that we use in earthquake resistant design under ASCE 7. The vertical axis or Y axis on this plot is what we call spectral acceleration. And the horizontal axis is the period of the structure. Now, why this is useful is if someone has gone to the trouble of creating a response spectrum for you, and you are asked to determine what the structure's response is, you can do this very simply by finding what the period of your structure is using the formula that I showed you earlier. Uh, you can go into the response spectrum plot at the period of the structure, in this case, two seconds. Uh, and then you can read across over to the vertical axis to find out what the spectral acceleration of the structure is. And in this case, we can see it's approximately 20% of the acceleration due to gravity. Then we can find the maximum of force in the structure simply as force equals mass times acceleration. Uh, and with this point 2G, spectral acceleration, we read for the two second structure, we find simply that the force will be equal to 20% of the structure's weight. And then we can find the structure's maximum displacement as the force divided by the structure's stiffness. Or if you don't actually know the structure's stiffness, a formula that is very handy to use, and it works even for high rise buildings, is the formula on the right that you see here. Uh, T squared over four pi squared times the spectral acceleration uh, times the acceleration due to gravity will give you the displacement of the structure without knowing its stiffness.
So far, we've been talking about structures that are linear elastic. Most real structures, when subjected to strong earthquake ground motion, behave in what we call a nonlinear manner. The plot on the right is a plot of force versus displacement for a structure that is behaving in a linear elastic manner. The structure is displaced by the earthquake to point one, then the point two, then the point three, and it comes back at rest to point zero. The plot on the right is a structure that's been subject that is at behaving in a nonlinear manner. When the structure behaves in a nonlinear manner, it responds to the motion of the earthquake first in a linear manner, and then it reaches a point, we call it, I'll call it here x sub y, at which the structure begins to experience damage. The damage could be yielding of steel elements, it could be cracking of concrete or masonry elements, it could be slips, slipping of nails in a wood structure, but the structure's stiffness begins to degrade. Its strength may still increase at that point, and you can continue to push the structure until it reaches an ultimate displacement level, shown here as x sub u. And if you push the structure beyond x sub u, it begins to degrade not only in stiffness, but also in strength. Uh, when a structure behaves in a nonlinear manner and you release the force on the structure, it doesn't return back under the same path in which it traveled in the original forcing. And in fact, when you are done pushing the structure, it typically will not come to rest at the same point, but rather will have some residual displacement. Nonlinear response is actually very beneficial if a structure has sufficient ductility because it enables the structure to resist forces that are much larger than its yield strength without collapsing. The plot that you see on the right is a force displacement plot for a linear elastic structure uh, that has been subjected to an earthquake ground motion. And what you can see is that for this particular structure, it experiences a peak, peak strength demand of about 200 kips, and it sees a peak displacement of just about five inches. The plot on the right shows the same structure. However, it has a yield strength of 100 kips. Uh, and when it is subjected to the same ground motion, it doesn't see any more force than its yield strength, 100 kips, and it actually sees less displacement. And the reason it's seeing less displacement uh, and less force is because of this yielding behavior. Uh, when the structure yields, it tends to do two things. First, it detunes itself from the frequency of the ground motion. As it yields, its stiffness changes. And as that stiffness changes, its period changes. And that means it becomes out of tune with the ground motion. The other thing that happens is that it dissipates energy in the form of the area under these loops that you see here. And that dissipation of energy results in additional damping. And this, those two effects lead to a response of a nonlinear structure that can be less severe, less intense than the response of a linear structure. Uh, that means that there's less force on the elements in the structure. There's lower acceleration on the people and the contents in the building or the structure. Uh, and that generally it will be an easier ride for the structure. The downside to this, of course, to this nonlinear response is the nonlinearity is a result of damage, yielding and buckling, cracking, uh, that damage can make a building weaker uh, and it can make it uninhabitable. And so in the building code, we do a trade-off between taking advantage of the benefit of nonlinear response, being able to design structures for a fraction of the force that would cause them to yield, uh, but take the risk at the same time that they will be damaged. And our building code has many criteria in it that are intended to assure that when the building goes nonlinear in a response to earthquake shaking, that the damage doesn't become too severe and become life threatening. So I'll let, with that, I'll ask if there are any questions before we go on. Um, 
we we don't have any questions right now okay very good then i'll move on to the next section The first part in the structural design process, as I said, for seismic resistance is to determine the structure's risk category. Uh, and this is based on its intended use and its occupancy. Last week, we talked about the concept of acceptable risk, which is all about how much damage are we willing to accept in a structure. Uh, and some structures, we're willing to accept a lot of damage as long as it doesn't result in collapse and endangerment of life safety. And in other structures, for example, hospitals, uh, fire stations, uh, where we need the, the building to be useful uh, immediately after the earthquake, we're willing to accept much less damage. And so the building code and ASCE 7 uh, tier their requirements based on the structure's risk category. And structures in higher risk categories are intended to be less tolerant of damage and designed more conservatively so they will experience less damage. ASCE 7 defines risk category for different building types in table 1.5.1, which is in chapter one. The building code, the international building code, actually does not adopt chapter one of ASCE 7. And the building code has its own categorization of risk categories. And if you're in a community that has adopted a building code, and most communities in the United States have today, uh, then rather than table 1.5-1 in ASCE 722, you should use the similar table in the building code to determine the risk category of a structure. Today, we're going to focus primarily on the ASCE 7 criteria, but talk a bit about the IBC requirements as well. Note that where a building code is adopted, as I said, you have to use the IBC criteria rather than the ASCE 7 criteria. There are four risk categories of structure, both in ASCE 7 and in the building code. The lowest category, category one, uh, is for buildings and structures that are not typically occupied by people. This includes equipment storage sheds, barns, and other agricultural buildings, things like silos, uh, and structures that do not contain equipment or systems that are necessary either for disaster recovery, or if the structure were to fail, that would result in the release of hazardous materials. The goal of the building code uh, for these risk category one structures is to provide a low probability that the structure will collapse uh, in response to ground motion. But we're not so worried for these types of structures about the behavior of non-structural components that are in the building or structure, because, because it's a risk category one structure, there's not supposed to be anyone in the building uh, during an earthquake. And so if a light fixture or something like that falls off of where it's mounted, it's not going to hurt anyone. Uh, and since there are no equipment in the structure required to operate, we don't really care if the equipment operates after an earthquake. Most buildings and structures that we design are going to be in risk category two. Uh, in the building code, risk category two, rather than having a very long laundry list that indicates all the types of building occupancies that categorize a building as risk category two, it simply says that if you're not in risk category one, three, or four, you are in risk category two. But risk category two includes most buildings we live and work in. Uh, the goals uh, for earthquake performance for risk category two buildings is to, like risk category one, to have a low probability of earthquake-induced collapse. Uh, but in addition, we limit the probability or seek to limit the probability that shaking imposed damage to non-structural components would pose a significant risk to building occupants. Risk category three includes buildings and structures that have large numbers of occupants. An office building in a major city like New York or Chicago or Los Angeles or San Francisco uh, may have thousands of people in it. Uh, and as a society, we regard it as less acceptable 
to have a building like that fail than a building that has only a few people in it. And so we adopt more conservative design criteria for buildings like that. We also design more conservative design criteria for buildings that have that have provide shelter for people with limited mobility. Uh, think of people in prisons, uh, young school children who are perhaps not as able to get out of a damaged building uh, as an adult, and some healthcare facilities uh, where people may be immobile due to their infirm condition. We also place in risk category three buildings and structures that contain materials that pose some risk to the public if released. Uh, and those structures and buildings that support lifelines and utilities important to a community's welfare. The intent being that we want to reduce the risk that those utilities and lifelines would be unavailable after a significant earthquake. The acceptable risk that the building code targets for risk category three structures a reduced risk of earthquake-induced collapse, so a lower probability of collapse than we accept for either risk category one or two structures. Reduced risk of shaking imposed damage to non-structural components and a low risk of release of hazardous materials or loss of function of critical lifelines and utilities. The highest risk category is risk category four, this is for buildings and structures that are either deemed essential to post-earthquake response. This includes hospitals, police stations, fire stations, emergency communication centers, air traffic control centers, and things of that nature. Uh, and we also put in risk category four structures that house very large quantities of hazardous materials that, if released, could pose a threat to the safety of many individuals. For these types of structures, we're looking for a very low risk of earthquake-induced collapse, a low risk that the building or structure will be damaged sufficiently to impair its use in post-earthquake response and recovery, and a very low risk of release of hazardous materials. Uh, you may have heard last week under Part A that for risk category one and two structures, we're looking for less than a 10% chance of collapse of the building if it exp experiences what we call maximum considered earthquake shaking. For risk category two buildings and structures, we're looking for about a 5% or lower risk of collapse if the building or structure experiences maximum considered shaking. And for risk category four structures, we want less than a 3% chance of collapse. For the risk category one and two structures, where we're targeting less than a 10% probability of collapse, given maximum considered earthquake shaking, in most parts of the United States, that results in less than a 1% chance in 50 years that the building or structure would collapse as a result of earthquake shaking. Do we have any questions at this time before I go on? Um. I don't see any specific question, but there is a comment from someone um, that uh, uh, damage to the structures in the inelastic response created a major issue in New Zealand, and uh, they had to um, do significant repairs. Um, some, uh, some of the structures have to be demolished and rebuilt. So in the New Zealand, they have uh, changed uh, the building code to um, consider the serviceability requirements. So, yeah, so that's the comment that we received. We don't have any questions. Yet. Okay, well, th that is an excellent comment. Um, we in the United States are also aware of what happened in Christchurch in 2011. Um, and there is a significant effort underway currently, uh, as may have been described last week, to develop building codes that will give us what we call functional recovery in a reasonable period of time so that our structures will not be severely damaged when they see large earthquakes. Uh, the building code community, uh, including representatives of FEMA, the United States Geological Survey, volunteer engineers like myself, uh, volunteer building officials are currently trying to come to grips as to what level of resiliency we can really afford and want as a society. 
very simply, we have the tools available to us today to design structures that will resist essentially any level of shaking they may see and not experience damage with, which would prevent their occupancy or use after the earthquake. But there is a cost to designing structures so that they won't be damaged by very severe earthquakes. Uh, in most areas of the United States, a building won't be affected by a very severe earthquake more often than hundreds to thousands of years apart. Uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, where I used to practice, we would say that a design earthquake had a probable recurrence period of about 500 years. In some parts of the southeastern and midwestern United States, the design earthquake may have a return period of 1,500 or more years. And so there is a, a significant debate going on today, and it will probably go on for some years in the future, as to how much money are we willing to spend as a society today to protect our buildings against damage which they may never experience in their lives? Because most buildings last 50 to 100 years, and if the event carries 500 or 1,000 years apart, then likely the building will never see that event. Um, but as, as our society becomes more affluent, as we are able to afford, better and better performance, our view of what is acceptable performance is changing. Uh, and so the building codes will be evolving, I believe, in the next few years to give us structures that will have less damage in earthquakes uh, and will perform better. But for today, the goals are, as I said it, uh, for risk category two structures, which is most of the structures we design, where we're seeking to provide as a low risk that those buildings will ever collapse as a result of earthquake shaking, uh, accepting that the buildings may not be usable uh, after that earthquake shaking. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Ronald. That, that was a very, I think, uh, good explanation uh, of the, for the question. Uh, we have another question regarding the risk, like how do we determine the risk for different categories? Okay, it's an excellent question. Uh, there actually is a FEMA document that was published about 10 years ago. It was developed by the Applied Technology Council, uh, and it presented a methodology of using nonlinear response history analysis, our most sophisticated analysis technique, to a large suite of ground motions to determine what the probability is that a building will collapse at different levels of ground shaking. Uh, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency has funded a number of studies over the past years where researchers and engineers have followed this methodology. It's called the ATC 63 methodology, uh, where researchers, and I think the FEMA number is FEMA P695, which by the way, you can download for free from the FEMA website. Um, it, well, FEMA has funded studies to look at different types of building structures, steel moment frames, wood shear walls, concrete shear walls, et cetera, uh, designed to the minimum requirements of the building code and determine what their collapse probability is. And then we've made adjustments to the building codes to try and ascertain that the buildings and structures we design will be adequately reliable by present day standards. Thank you so much, Ronald. Um, we don't have any questions uh, right now, so we, you can continue. Okay, I will go on then. Thank you. The uh, next step in the design process is to determine, based on the building's location and its site conditions, what the design ground shaking is for the building. The curve that you see here on the right is what we call a seismic hazard curve. And what the seismic hazard curve does is it tells you the maximum intensity of ground shaking that is likely to occur at a specific site within a given number of years that we call its return period. And so what, what you can see here on this particular chart, we've plotted the probability uh, or the return period uh, for peak ground acceleration of different levels. And for this particular site that's shown here, we can see that 
the peak, a peak ground, it's the ground motion with a peak ground acceleration of about 1G uh, would likely have a return period of something around 5,000 years. Ground shaking with a peak ground acceleration of about 0.5G, a return period of 1,000 years. Ground shaking with a peak ground acceleration of about 0.2G, 100 years. These hazard curves are going to look somewhat different at every site depending on the location of the site relative to potential earthquake faults, uh, and also depending on the soil conditions of the site. However, the shape of these hazard curves is always going to be similar. It is going to show that at low return periods, as you increase return period, you have a very significant change in hazard. And eventually, as you get out to longer and longer return periods, the change in hazard uh, with return period becomes small. What this essentially means is that at any site, minor earthquakes that cause relatively little damage will occur frequently. Large and intense earthquakes that have the potential to cause extensive damage will occur, as I said earlier, very rarely. And ASCE 7, basically using the concept of acceptable risk, selects a design earthquake uh, that results in a low probability of unacceptable consequences where we today, we define unacceptable consequences in terms of life safety. In the future, we may define unacceptable consequences in terms of the risk of not being able to use a building after an earthquake. ASCE 7 represents ground motion uh, in terms of a smoothed design response spectrum. What I have shown on this plot here is the response spectra for several different earthquakes, an earthquake that occurred in Dujj, Turkey uh, back in 1999, the El Centro earthquake in the 1940s, uh, in California, the Loma Prieta earthquake in 1989 in Northern California, uh, and the Landers earthquake that occurred in 1993 uh, in Southern California. And each one of these spectra for each one of these earthquake records has a somewhat similar shape, but not an identical shape. Real earthquake ground motions tend to produce little peaks and valleys. Um, and it's really impossible for us to predict before an earthquake occurs what the nature of those peaks and valleys in a ground motion is going to be at a site. But we can, by looking at many earthquakes that have occurred over the years, uh, on sites having similar soil conditions, we can generally predict the shape of what the spectra is going to be where we've ironed out those peaks and valleys. And we call a spectra shown here with the dark blue line that has that smooth shape, a smooth design with spectrum. And that smooth design spectrum is, as I've said, the way we characterize design ground shaking in ASC 7 The design response spectrum is going to be different for each site, depending on where the site is located relative to potential faults, the magnitudes of earthquakes that can occur on those faults, how active those faults are and what the frequency of currents of earthquakes of different magnitudes will be, the type of soil and how deep it is at the building site, the distance of the site to the fault, how deep below the ground surface the rupture may occur, and actually the mechanism of fault rupture, whether it's a strike slip fault, a thrust fault, a reverse fault, each of these different types of earthquakes tend to produce earthquake motion having somewhat different character. And so the United States Geological Survey does seismic hazard analysis around the United States, basically on a two kilometer by two kilometer grid, taking into account all of these factors uh, and develops a database of design ground motions. Using ASCE 7 to access that database and determine the design ground motion for a site, we follow three steps. One, we determine the site class. Chapter 20 of ASCE 7 presents detailed procedures for determining the site class. Determining the site class can be expensive. It requires on-site geotechnical investigation. And for smaller projects, 
it may not make sense to spend the amount of money and effort necessary to accurately determine the site class. And for those types of, types of projects, ASCE 7 permits the use on most sites of what we call a default site class, which I'll describe in a little more detail later. Once we've determined the site class for the site or have decided to use the default site class, we next want to determine the ordinates of the design response spectrum using values contained in the USGS online database, uh, which is accessed from an ASCE, American Society of Civil Engineers, hazards tool, which is online and available for free. It is also possible and sometimes beneficial to retain a geotechnical engineer or seismologist to perform site-specific hazard studies for the site uh, in order to get a spectrum which is more accurate than what you might get out of the USGS database. In earlier editions of ASCE 716, you were encouraged to get a site-specific seismic hazard study for design of a major project. Uh, under ASCE 722, that encouragement has gone away. And the reason for that is because the USGS has become much more sophisticated in the way it determines the values of spectral response parameters at different sites. And really, the USGS values are site-specific values today. So we will access the USGS database through the ASCE 7 hazards tool and determine the design spectral response parameters necessary for design. This table here, table 20.2-1 from ASCE 7 shows how the site class for a building site is determined. Uh, if you attended the part A training last week, you heard that the character of, of soils at a building site greatly affects the intensity of ground shaking. On sites that have near surface hard rock, uh, ground shaking tends to have very high frequency content and not much frequency content at longer periods. On very soft sites, the frequency content of where most of the energy is tends to be at longer periods. Uh, and the soft soils, much like a bowl of jello, can actually amplify the ground shaking at longer periods. And so in ASCE 722, we define nine different site classes, A, B, B, C, 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 D, D, et cetera, based on the average shear wave velocity of the soil in the top 30 meters, that's approximately 100 feet from the ground surface. Uh, one of the significant differences between ASCE 722 and past editions of ASCE 7 is that we have created some new site classes. In ASCE 716 and earlier editions, we had site classes A, B, C, D, E, and F. Uh, and what we found uh, in a study that was done a few years ago was that there tended to be very large differences between the design spectra you would get on a site class B and a site class C and between a spectrum on a site class C and a site class D. Uh, and so as a means of not overly penalizing a project that is located on a site with intermediate soil conditions, we introduced some intermediate soil site classes. So we introduced the BC, CD, and DE site classes. Most sites don't have uniform soil over the top 100 feet below grade. Uh, shown here is a hypothetical soil, soil profile uh, for a site that consists of 40 feet of stiff clay with a shear wave velocity of 600 feet per second, 20 feet of a dense sand with a shear wave velocity of about 1600 feet per second, uh, and then beneath that bedrock with a shear wave velocity of 3000 feet per second. So to determine the average shear wave velocity, we simply take a weighted average, taking an a weighted average of the depth of the soil deposit beneath the surface uh, times the shear wave velocity of that deposit, and we average them. So in this case, 40 feet times 600 
20 feet times 1600, 40 feet times 3000 divided by 100 feet, we come up with a shear wave velocity of 1760 feet per second. Uh, going into table 20.2-1 at ASCE 7, we would find that that would place us in site class C for this particular building site. Shear wave velocities can be determined in a number of ways. Uh, typically, it requires on-site geotechnical investigation. Uh, you can drill bore holes into the soil going 100 feet or more depth deep, uh, and you can set off charges within the holes, basically little explosives. Uh, and then by putting recording instruments in other holes located at other locations on the site, you can determine the amount of time it takes for the noise from the explosion, or the shear waves from the explosion, to reach the instrument and determine the shear wave velocity. Uh, that technique is called a cross-hole cross -hole shear wave velocity technique. It's also possible to do a single hole shear wave velocity measurement by measuring the amount of time it takes waves to travel up the boring. Uh, it's also possible to use uh, impulse techniques, much like sonar on a submarine, to determine what the shear wave velocity on a site is. I said earlier that ASCE 7 permits you to use a default site class. Uh, if you don't want to go through the effort of doing the site investigation to determine what the actual site class is. Uh, you are able to do that on any site under ASCE 7, unless the authority having jurisdiction, that is the building official, has determined that soils in the area of that site uh, are very soft deposits being classed as type D, E, E, or F. So if you're not on one of those sites, and those sites typically occur along riverbeds uh, or adjacent to large lakes uh, where the water has deposited soft soil over many years. Uh, if you're not on one of those sites, then you can simply take the worst response spectral ordinates consuming con that you would get for site class C, C, D, or D, all right? So if you don't want to determine your shear wave velocity at a site, you can use this default site class, which is the worst spectrum that you would get for any of classes C, C, D, or D. And I'll show you what that means in a bit here. In order to determine in earlier editions of ASCE 7, ASCE 7, 16, and early, had a series of maps that would show you the spectral values uh, the spectral acceleration values on sites with a reference soil condition, basically site class B conditions for maximum considered earthquake shaking. Uh, you could go into those maps, pull off the values from contours on the maps, modify them from for site class, uh, and then take two thirds of those values in order to get the design earthquake shaking spectral ordinance. Uh, you cannot really do that anymore uh, in ASCE 722. Uh, and the reason for that is we took, determined about 10 years ago that the spectral shape that was constructed using the two values of spectral response acceleration, short period and one second period, was not particularly conservative for sites that were subjected to large magnitude earthquakes and which had soft soils present. Uh, and so instead, under ASCE 722, the USGS database has been expanded to give you not the values of spectral ordinates at two periods, a short period and one second period, but rather at 20 periods, uh, from ranging from zero seconds to 10 seconds, based on input of the structure's location and also its site class. You can access this tool online uh, at the URL that I show here. It is free and open to everyone. Uh, in addition to showing the parameters for ASCE 722, uh, it also shows the parameters for early editions of ASCE 7. So you can use this tool today 
to do design using ASCE 716. And you can also, <coughs> excuse me, use the same tool uh, to determine the design parameters for other environmental hazards, including wind, snow, atmospheric icing, et cetera. Once you've brought up the tool in your window, uh, the first step is to enter the project location. There are three ways to do that. You can enter a street address, city and state. You can drop a pin on a map, or you can enter the latitude and longitude. For this particular example, I've used the location of the city of Seattle building department in Seattle, Washington, which happens to have an address at 705th Eric. Fifth Avenue in Seattle. Uh, and as you can see, when you enter in an address such as that, you bring up a map of the city and you can zoom in on that map to make sure that your project site is actually properly located. Uh, once you've entered the site location, you are prompted to enter in Windows the, a, the edition of ASCE 7 that you're using. Here I've used ASCE 722. The risk category for the building, here I've used risk category two. The site class, here I've used site class C, which is very common in downtown Seattle, uh, and selected the hazards that I want data for. In this case, I've only selected seismic, but as I said earlier, you can also select snow, flood, wind, rain, et cetera. When you've done that, you click the button at the bottom that says view results. After entering view, view results, you're asked to select whether you want a full report or a summary report. In this example, I've asked for a full report. And the results look like this. It presents you an echo printout of the data that you put in showing the location of the site, its site class, and the risk category. Uh, and then it presents you a series of spectra for the site. It presents you what we call a multi-period response spectrum, which is the 20 ordinates that I've told you about. And we show that for maximum considered earthquake shaking and also for design earthquake shaking. And then we show you the so-called two-period spectrum uh, based on the spectral response coefficients S sub DS and S sub D1 that was used by earlier codes uh, and can still be used in ASCE 722 if you have a desire to do so. If you ask for the full report, you can bring up a tabulation of the spectral parameters uh, used for design. Uh, these include the peak ground acceleration, S sub MS, S sub M1, S sub DS, and S sub D1, uh, the long period transition period, T sub L, uh, and several other values. You can bring up the multi-period response spectrum. And if you ask for details, uh, you can bring up a table of the ordinates for each one of those periods. And if you ask for a CSV file, you can actually download a, a spreadsheet form such as you see here uh, that you can input into your structural analysis software in order to represent the design response spectrum. I spoke earlier about the use of the default site class instead of the site specific class. Uh, shown on the left here is the multi period design response spectrum for the city of Seattle's building department on site class C on the left. And on the right is the multi period response spectrum for that same site, but instead of assuming site class C, assuming the default site class. And what you can see here is that at a period, for example, of about two seconds, using the site class C, we would have a design, design spectral response acceleration of about 0.3 G. At two seconds using the default site class, we would have a design spectral response spectrum of 0.5 G. So depending on what your site is, using the default site class can result in quite a penalty in terms of the amount of force that you have to design a structure for. And so really you should use the default site class 
only for really small building projects uh, where it doesn't make sense to spend the money to get a site-specific assessment of the shear wave velocity. This is what's called the two-period response spectrum. Uh, this was the design response spectrum that was used in earlier editions of ASCE 7, including ASCE 716. It was characterized basically by two spectral response ordinates. The first of these was the short period design spectral acceleration, S sub DS, and the second is the spectral, the design spectral response acceleration at one period second, S sub D1. Uh, and the response spectrum basically had a plateau at periods less than T sub S uh, and a hyperbolic portion of the spectrum where the spectral acceleration was defined as the value of S sub D1 divided by the structure's period T. Uh, and then at periods longer than T sub L, the long period transition period, the spectral acceleration was computed as S sub D1 times the value of T sub L divided by the structure's fundamental period squared. Uh, this spectrum is still in ASCE 722. It's basically vestigial. As I said, we recommend that you use the more accurate multi-period response spectrum shape. Uh, but this, this two-period response spectrum does still serve as the basis for the so-called base shear equations that are contained in chapter 12 under the equivalent lateral force technique that we'll be talking about in a little while. There is still a series of maps in ASCE 722. Uh, these are only for the default site class. And they give you the values of maximum considered earthquake shaking, S sub MS and S sub M1 at those two periods. And you can determine S sub DS and S sub D1 by going into the maps, taking two thirds of the values for S sub MS and S sub M1 respectively. Again, I don't recommend you do this. Even if you're using the default site class, you can use the ASCE hazard tool to obtain that data. Uh, and frankly, these maps are very hard to read in places where earthquake activity is significant, such as California, Utah, Seattle, Washington area. So that I'll ask if there are again any questions. Um, Ronald, actually, you are doing great in the with the explanations, and we don't see any questions right now. Okay, uh, that's great. And I, I think at this point, why don't we take a break? Uh, by my watch, it's ten after eleven. So why don't we start again in five minutes at fifteen after eleven? Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. There is a question before you can move on to the next question, the next section. Okay. Um, and it relates to like the the changing of uh, two period um, spectrum to twenty period spectrum. So the question is like we are reducing the building cost by moving from the two period like more conservative spectrum to like a, an actual twenty period spectrum. Um, but how does such approach mesh with the debate of providing the long-term fun functionality? Uh, somebody commented that they seem opposed to each other. Okay, well, it's an excellent question. First, I'll say that the multi-period spectrum doesn't always result in a lower spectral ordinate than you would get off of the two-period spectrum. And in fact, the reason we went to the multi-period spectrum was because we found that on sites subject to large magnitude earthquakes, say magnitude seven or larger, uh, and which have soft soil conditions, D or E, that the spectral ordinate you would get at longer periods, say periods of one second and longer, uh, for buildings on those types of sites, could be substantially larger, 50% or more than you would get off of the two period spectrum. 
And so really we didn't go to the multi-period spectrum for reasons of economy to basically reduce the spectral ordinates, but rather to make sure that we were actually getting the performance that we wanted, all right? Uh, and the person that asked the question may have been confused because I said that we went to additional site classes for reasons of economy, and that is true. And again, that's related to this effect that for sites subjected to large magnitude earthquakes that have soft deposits of soft soils, the difference between a site class C multi-period response spectrum and a site class D was a lot, could be 30, 40%. And we just wanted to provide a smoother gradation between the various site classes. So that the building that was on a site that was borderline between C and D didn't get penalized by having to go all the way to D. Yeah, I think that's, that's an excellent answer. Um, we don't see any more questions, so I think you can uh, okay. move on to the next. And then we'll move on. Uh, the next step in the process, once you know what the site class is and what the site, the design ground motion spectral ordinates are, uh, is to determine what we call a seismic design category. What seismic design categories do is they combine the effects of the performance we want out of a building and the intensity of shaking that the building is likely to experience in order to determine how much seismic design is actually necessary to get the targeted performance. Regardless of the quality of design and construction, not all buildings pose the same seismic risk. The, the two factors that affect this risk include the intensity of ground shaking the building will experience and the structure's use. Under small earthquakes that occur frequently, low intensity ground shaking, no matter how a structure is designed, even if it is not designed specifically for earthquake resistance, it likely won't experience any damage. Uh, those of you familiar with the modified Mercalli intensity scale uh, would know, for example, that at MMI intensity of six or lower, you really don't expect any significant structural damage. Uh, at intensity seven, you start to experience some significant damage. At intensities eight and nine, even well-engineered structures can experience significant damage the way we design them today. And so the risk, the seismic design categories uh, consider the effect of the intensity of motion the building is likely to experience, uh, and also the consequences or the occupancy of the building uh, in determining how much seismic design is really required. There are six seismic design categories ranging from A to F with seismic design category A representing the structures that pose the least seismic risk, either because the intensity of ground shaking they are likely to experience is very low, less than MMI7, or because their occupancy is such that they don't pose a significant risk. So seismic design categories A and B are representative of low risk conditions. Seismic design category A is buildings located in regions having a very small probability of ever, ever experiencing MMI6 or larger ground shaking. For seismic design category A structures, we don't really require design for a specific earthquake. Rather, uh, what we do is try to assure that structures have some basic structural integrity capability so that if in the very unlikely event they experience destructive ground shaking, they could survive it. And at the same time, this provides some nominal resistance for other events that may occur during the building's life, including such things as a truck driving into a column at street level. Risk category, seismic design category B represent structures that pose a little bit more seismic risk. These are structures of ordinary occupancy that could experience moderate intensity shaking. Moderate intensity, you can think of design ground shaking of MMI-7. These structures must be designed to resist seismic forces 
specifically related with two-layer design spectral response parameters. Uh, and parapets and other critical architectural elements must be braced to resist the anticipated seismic forces. Seismic design category C represents structures of ordinary occupancy that could experience MMI-8 shaking and important structures, structures in risk categories three and four that could experience MMI-7 shaking. For these structures, they must be designed to resist the specific seismic forces from the design spectrum. Uh, we prohibit the use of some types of structural systems that have historically performed poorly in earthquakes. We require non-structural components and systems required for life safety protection to be designed for seismic resistance and to be demonstrated to be capable of post-earthquake functionality. And these systems would include things like emergency egress lighting, uh, fire protection systems, things of that nature. Seismic design category D includes structures that could experience MMI-9 shaking if they're ordinary occupancy, or MMI-8 shaking if they are risk category three or four structures. Again, the structures are designed to resist seismic forces. Uh, only systems, structural systems that are capable of providing good seismic performance, uh, as demonstrated by research and past earthquakes are permitted to be used. Non-structural components that could cause injury if they're displaced by earthquake shaking must be provided with seismic restraint. Non-structural components and systems required for life safety protection uh, must be seismically designed and demonstrated capable of post-earthquake function and special construction quality assurance measures are required during the construction process. Seismic design category E structures uh, are structures that would otherwise be qualified as capable of being in seismic design category D, but which could experience very intense ground shaking. Basically, ground shaking with a peak ground acceleration of 0.75 G or more. Uh, these structures must be designed to all the requirements for seismic design category D. Uh, there are some more limits on the types of structural systems that can be used, and some, some conditions of structural irregularity are prohibited. Seismic design category F structures are critically important structures, fire stations, hospitals, police stations, like that, that are located very close to major active faults and could experience very intense ground shaking. Uh, for these structures, all of the size requirements for seismic design category E apply. And in addition, there are more restrictions on structural system types that can be used and also on the types of irregularities that can be present. One determines the seismic design category for a structure based on its risk category and also on the value of the structural of the spectral response parameters S sub DS or S sub D1 at the site. Uh, and, and for typical structures that do not have short periods, you take the most severe value determined either in accordance with table 11.6-1 or 11.6-2. So you would go into the table and say, I'm risk category four, for example, and I have a spec short period spectral design acceleration of 0.2 G, therefore I would be in risk category C, in seismic design category C. Questions on the determination of seismic design category? Um, currently, we, we don't see any questions. That's good, um, we'll move right yeah. along. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to get into detailed structural design criteria. The first thing that one has to do uh, after having determined the design category is to determine what type of seismic force resisting system you can use. And as I said, in seismic design categories, C, D, E, and F, there are restrictions on which structural systems can be used. 
the seismic force resisting system that you can use in a design depend on the seismic design category determined as we've just talked about and also the building structure type. ASCE 7 actually recognizes three different types of structures. There are building structures, non-building structures with structural systems like those of buildings, and non-building structures that do not have structural systems like those of buildings. And so we categorize which type of structure we are, uh, and then we determine based on the seismic design category and the structure's height, what type of structural system we can use. Buildings have certain types of features that tend to give them good earthquake performance. Typically they're enclosed, which means they have exterior walls. And also typically because people are occupying them, uh, there are going to be different rooms with interior partitions. The exterior cladding on a building, the interior partitions in a building tend to introduce both damping uh, and also additional structural resistance that we don't rely upon when we're designing the structure. Uh, and we take account of those characteristics of buildings when setting the design parameters. Common structural systems that are used in building systems include load-bearing walls, braced frames, moment frames, and dual systems. If you're designing a building structure, the design, the structural design criteria are going to be found in ASCE 7, Chapter 12. Non-building structures are commonly found in industrial facilities, uh, like this power plant that I'm showing here. Uh, they may be enclosed or partially enclosed or totally open. Uh, and therefore don't have the advantage of the damping that comes along with cladding and interior partitions. The human occupancy may be incidental to its intended use. And therefore, if there's damage to the structure, there may be lower risk to people. Uh, another factor in these types of structures is that they tend to be very irregular. Uh, you can see in this photo here that some of these structures have some very large pressure vessels in them. Uh, they have soft stories in them and other irregularities that can make their performance less advantageous than what would happen for a building system. Uh, non, non -build, some non-building structures have structure, have structural systems like those typically used for buildings. Uh, these include load-bearing walls, brace frames, moment frames, and dual systems, as I described earlier. For those structures um, that are non-building structures with structural systems like those found in buildings, again, we use Chapter 12. And then there are non-building structures that don't look anything like a building. They may be enclosed or partially enclosed or open, uh, but they may not have the typical rectangular shape of buildings. Uh, human occupancy typically does not occur, and they have structural systems that look nothing like anything you would find in a building. So for example, in this tank here, the structural system is the round circular wall around the outside of the tank. The same thing for these furnaces that you see here at a petroleum refinery. Uh, the cooling towers at this industrial facility on the lower right hand side here uh, basically has a series of spaced wood horizontal members that provide the lateral resistance of that structure. You don't find those types of systems in buildings. Uh, and so we use, tend to use or require more conservative design parameters for these types of structural systems. Uh, and those are governed by ASCE 7 chapter 15. Structural system selection occurs after the design ground motion for the site is known and the type of structure is known. Uh, the giant designer chooses a structural system uh, which is designated the seismic force resisting system. And the seismic force resisting systems that are available in the building code in ASCE 7 are categorized both by the material type, for example, structural steel, wood, reinforced concrete, reinforced masonry, 
And based on the detailing of those systems, the amount of ductility that can be expected of the structures. Buildings and structures that are assigned to seismic design category A can use any type of structural system, even structural systems that are not listed in ASCE 7. That's because we never anticipate they will be experience destructive ground shaking, and so we're not very worried about how they will perform in ground shaking. Buildings classified as seismic design category B through F must use one of the several specific seismic force resisting systems or combinations of those systems listed in table 12.2-1 of the ASCE 7 standard. Uh, table 12.2.1 is very large and includes currently almost 100 structural systems. It goes on for several pages in the standard. Uh, I've shown one page of it in the lower left-hand corner, uh, and I've shown a small excerpt from that table covering some of the bearing wall systems uh, at the bottom of this slide. Uh, and what you can see is that the table lists the system by name. So in this case, special reinforced concrete shear walls, reinforced concrete ductile coupled walls, ordinary reinforced concrete shear walls, etc. There is a reference to a section in ASCE 7 chapter 14, where the specific detailing requirements for that structural system are listed. There is a tabulation of the response modification coefficient R. <coughs> a tabulation of the overstrength factor, omega sub zero and a tabulation of the deflection amplification coefficient, C sub D, uh, all of which are specific to the particular seismic force resisting system you select. And then over on the right-hand side of the table is a listing of the seismic design categories, B, C, D, E, and F, and the maximum height of the structure that the particular seismic force resisting system can be used here. So for example, for special reinforced concrete shear walls detailed in accordance with ASCE 7 section 14.2, we have a response modification coefficient of five, an overstrength factor of two and a half, a deflection amplification coefficient of five. In seismic design categories B and C, we can use that seismic force resisting system for a structure of any height. And in seismic design categories D and E, only for structures that are 160 feet or less in height, and in seismic design category F, only for structures that are 100 feet or less in height. Some of the noteworthy restrictions on seismic force resisting system use in different design categories are that plain concrete and plain masonry, that's basically unreinforced concrete and unreinforced masonry bearing wall systems are not permitted in seismic design category C, D, E, or F. And this is because structures of that type have performed very poorly in earthquakes all over the world. Ordinary concrete and ordinary basic masonry bearing wall systems are not permitted in seismic design categories D or higher because we've seen that concrete and masonry structures that don't have the special detailing requirements required of intermediate or special systems just are not capable of resisting MMI-8 or greater shaking intensities. Ordinary concentric brace steel frames are not permitted in seismic design categories D and E for buildings exceeding 35 feet in height or in seismic design category F for buildings of any height. Brace frames and walls of any material cannot be used as the only seismic force resisting system in structures exceeding 160 feet in height in seismic design categories D, E, or F, unless they meet certain configuration limits, meaning that they are very regular. If they are very regular, that 160 foot limit is increased to 240 feet. Once a structural system is selected, for example, special reinforced concrete moment frame, the structure must be configured and detailed to meet the specific requirements of chapter 14 of ASCE 7 
and the referenced material standards, such as ACI 318, AISC 341, TMS 402, and the National Design Specification that Chapter 14 points to. For some structural systems where the ASCE 7 committee does not believe that the material industry, the industry material standards, such as AISCE, AISC 341, does not provide specific protection in order to merit the R factor given in Table 12.2.1, Chapter 14 will include some additional detailing requirements. The International Building Code does not actually adopt Chapter 14. And so when designing to the International Building Code, you're really not required to follow Chapter 14, but it is highly recommended by the ASCE 7 committee. For non-building structures, there are two tables in Chapter 15 that tell you about the available seismic force resisting systems uh, and the R, C sub D, and omega zero coefficients that are applicable to them, as well as the height limits that are applicable. Tables 15.4.1 and 15.4.2 take into account the reduced human occupancy of typical non-building structures. Uh, and they also take into account the, the lower damping and the higher irregularity of these types of structures. Uh, shown here, uh, next to table 12.2.1 on the right is table 15.4.1, which applies to non-building structures with structural systems like uh, building structures. Uh, and it's very similar to table 12.2.1, but has somewhat relaxed height criteria related to table 12.2.1. Table 15.4.2 applies to non-building structures with seismic force resisting systems, not like those of buildings. And I've shown an excerpt of that table here. Uh, you can see it shows things like elevated tanks as an example, or cooling towers. Again, it shows the RSC sub D and omega zero coefficients associated with the particular type of structure it references a detailing requirements section in chapter 15, and it presents the height limits for the various seismic design categories. Now I'd like to talk in some detail about the R, C sub D and omega zero coefficients and what they are intended to represent. The chart that you see on the left here is a response spectrum However, it's plotted in somewhat different format than you are used to seeing. Typical response spectra are plotted in the form of spectral acceleration on the y-axis versus period on the horizontal or x-axis. This particular response spectrum is plotted still with spectral acceleration uh, as the y-axis, but instead of period, it uses displacement, spectral displacement, as the horizontal axis. You may recall that earlier in the presentation, I said that if you know the period of a structure and you know its spectral acceleration, you can determine its spectral displacement simply as t squared over four pi squared times the spectral acceleration of the structure times the coefficient of the acceleration due to gravity, g. So that relationship has been used to, to convert a typical spectral acceleration versus period response spectrum to a spectral acceleration versus displacement response spectrum. Uh, this type of response spectrum has a specific name. It's called the ADRS or acceleration displacement response spectrum. Um, the diagonal straight line that you see here represents the spectral response of a structure having a particular period. So it for this particular structure having this particular period, if it's linear and elastic, it will experience displacement delta, it will experience spectral acceleration S sub A of T, and the force of the structure will be S sub A of T times the structure's weight. Now, if the structure goes nonlinear, as the structure experiences force in response to the earthquake, it's going to start to soften and to degrade in stiffness, as I talked about earlier. And rather than its 
response being shown as a straight line, as was the case for this blue line here, the structure's nonlinear response will be represented by this broken red line that you see here, which is sometimes called a pushover curve. In addition to the structure's response changing, its stiffness changing, its period lengthening, the other thing that happens is it starts to experience more damping. And as a result of that, there is a nonlinear response spectrum shown by this red curve here that is somewhat reduced in amplitude from the linear response spectrum. Where this particular ground motion represented both by the linear and nonlinear response spectrum will push a nonlinear structure that has this pushover curve is to the point where the pushover curve intersects the nonlinear ADRS spectrum. And that will produce a somewhat different displacement. It will produce a somewhat different force in the structure. And so the R, C sub D, and omega zero coefficients are intended to relate the linear response of a hypothetical infinitely strong structure to the nonlinear response of the real structure. The value R, the response modification coefficient, tells you the required minimum yield strength of the structure. Uh, and is obtained by basically dividing the linear spectral response acceleration by the coefficient r. The c sub d coefficient tells you the relationship between the displacement the structure will experience in its nonlinear response to the ground motion to that it would experience if stressed just to its yield point. And the omega zero coefficient is a measure of how much overstrength the structure is going to occur and how much real force may occur on structural elements during its peak response. You never have to use the ADRS spectrum when designing a structure, but that's what the R, C sub D, and omega zero coefficients are about. Uh, and before I go on to the next step, which is determining the design forces for the structure, I'd like to ask again if there are any other questions. Uh, thanks, Ronald. We, we do have uh, uh, questions. So the first one is, uh, how does the operational and immediate occupancy performance limits uh, relate to the, the selection of the structural system? Okay. The, the way that, well, first of all, we know that some structural systems are more damageable than other structural systems. Uh, and some structural systems, unless they are designed very strong, are not going to be able to obtain immediate occupancy or full functional recovery performance. Uh, so ASCE 7 uses the seismic design category uh, as a way to identify structures that need to be designed more conservatively. So as I said earlier, under, when selecting a seismic design category, in addition to looking at the intensity of ground motion the structure can experience, you're also looking at its risk category. And structures that are in higher risk categories, three and four, are thrown into higher seismic design categories. When they're thrown into higher seismic design categories, there are limitations on the types of structural systems that can be used so that we're trying to limit you to structural systems that will be able to obtain that performance when they experience the design ground shaking. Now there's a, another factor that I'll be showing as we get into the next section here, there's the occupancy importance factor I. And what the occupancy importance factor does is it modifies the response modification coefficient. You can think of the response modifi modification coefficient as being a measure of a structure's available ductility. Uh, structures with very high R values, six to eight, tend to be very ductile and can experience a lot of damage uh, without being unsafe to use. Structures that have structural systems with lower R values, two to four, don't have much ductility. What the occupancy importance factor does is it reduces the available response modification coefficient and therefore reduces the, available, the amount of ductility you're going to rely on, even if you choose a very resilient structural system so that the structure will experience less damage 
than a lower risk category structure. I hope that long answer responded to the question. Yeah, I think that that was a perfect answer to to this question. Um, there is one other question which is like you already mentioned as well. Um, uh, how do we consider the near fault effects in the in the seismic design procedure? Okay. In earlier building codes, there were near fault factors that actually amplified the ground motion. And I'm talking here the 1997 UBC, which probably none of you have ever used. But uh, there used to be specific amplification factors that were applied to the design spectrum to increase the forces. Uh, in ASCE 7, uh, you, the USGS database of design ground motions specifically considers the proximity of a site to, to faults that can cause earthquake shaking uh, and the spectral design values that are given in the USGS database consider the proximity of the site to faults. The other way that the proximity of a structure to faults is considered, uh, if you have very intense ground motion, as I said, uh, as the S1 coefficient exceeds 0.75 G, that means you're going to be located very close to a major active fault. And in that case, you're thrown into a higher seismic design category, which limits the amount of irregularities you can have, also limits the height that you can use structural systems in, and also prohibits some structural systems. So that's the way that near fault conditions are considered. Uh, yep, thank you uh, for this great answer. Um, there is a question regarding the uh, the height uh, with the structural systems. So if we have a particular structural systems and uh, system and we are just margin just like slightly uh, violating the height restriction on it, can we still use the same structural system with by doing the nonlinear analysis? And the answer to that is sometimes um, we would do that by using a performance-based procedure, and I'm actually going to talk about performance-based design uh, towards the end of this lecture. Uh, some communities will permit you to use performance-based design, uh, and actually they'll allow you to significantly exceed the height limits in Table 12-2. Uh, when you do that, other communities will not permit it. Uh, and sometimes, if you have only a slight exceedance of the limiting value in the table, you can go to the building official and beg for a special condition. So let's say you were designing, you wanted to design a reinforced concrete bearing wall structure that had a roof height of 170 feet and table 12.2.1 says, no, you can only use 160 feet. Uh, sometimes you may be able to go to the building official and beg and say, Oh, it's only 10 feet higher than the limit. Please let us do this because if we have to go to a moment resisting frame system, it's going to cost lots of money and it won't be practical to do this building. And this building is very important for the city. And some building officials will allow a designer to get away with that. But more commonly, the height limits are exceeded by using a performance based design approach. Yeah. And with that, uh, perhaps we should move on. And we, if there are additional questions, we can cover those at the end. Of things. Uh, no, we, we don't have any. So you may move on from that. All right. So now we're going to talk about the specific procedures that are used to determine the design seismic forces for its structures of different types and in, and in different design categories. Uh, in order to determine the design seismic forces, it's necessary to do a structural analysis. Uh, and in seismic design categories B, C, D, and E and F, uh, you do that analysis in each of two perpendicular or orthogonal directions. Uh, the seismic design force that you design the structure for is going to be a function of the structure's period. Uh, a seismic base shear force V, which are determined by formula. Uh, and then by performing structural analysis, you distribute that seismic base shear force V to the various stories of the structure. Uh, 
uh, and apply the perform an analysis, determine what the structure's deflections are and what the forces are, the moments, the shears, the axial loads, and all of the structures, seismic force, resistance, existing elements, including its beams, its columns, its braces, its walls, et cetera. There are four common techniques uh, that are used in ASCE 7 for determining the distribution of seismic forces in a structure. The most commonly used method of analysis is called the equivalent lateral force technique. Uh, and this is based specifically on the spectral response of a single degree of freedom uh, structural system, very similar to what I showed you earlier today. It's the easiest approach and it's what most people use to design most structures. You can use the modal response spectrum analysis technique. Uh, this is similar to the equivalent lateral force technique, except you perform a dynamic analysis to determine the structure's natural periods uh, and also its modes of vibration. Uh, and then you consider its modal properties in determining the seismic forces on the structure. Once you've used the modal properties to determine the seismic forces, you basically do a static analysis and distribute those forces throughout the structure. There is a linear response history analysis method, which basically is numerical integration of the complex equation of motion for a structure subject to the ground motion that I showed you on one of the first slides. And then there is a nonlinear response history analysis method, very similar to linear response history analysis, except the stiffness of the structure is allowed to vary with time, depending on the loading history that the structure has been subjected to in prior steps of the analysis. There is also a fifth method of analysis uh, that some of you may be familiar with. It's called the pushover technique or sometimes the nonlinear static analysis method. ASCE 7 does not actually permit the use of pushover analysis in the design of new structures, but another standard, ASCE 41, which is commonly used for the design or for the evaluation and design of seismic upgrades for existing structures does extensively use pushover analysis. We won't be talking about pushover analysis here. Something that is interesting uh, and that is new in ASCE 722, the equivalent lateral force technique used to be considered to be less than accurate when compared with the other techniques. Uh, and in fact, when you perform the other techniques, earlier editions of ASCE 7 actually allowed you to take a reduction in the amount of seismic force you were required to design for because it was felt that the analysis technique presented you a more reliable res resolution of what the structure's probable response would be. Interestingly, within the last 10 years, uh, when researchers and engineers did FEMA P695 studies uh, that I talked about earlier, they found that structures that were designed to the equivalent lateral force method actually performed better than structures that were designed to some of these other techniques. And the reason for that was the equivalent lateral force method, although not very accurate, uh, was fairly conservative and resulted in stronger structures than some of those other techniques. So in ASCE 722, the discount on the amount of lateral force you had to design for when you use those other structures has disappeared. There is in ASCE 7 also a simplified method, which is very similar to the equivalent lateral force technique. Uh, it basically is an equivalent lateral force technique. It's available only for use on some low rise structures, meaning lower than three stories in height that use stiff lateral force resisting systems and which have no irregularities and rigid diaphragms. Uh, basically what this simplified method allows you to do is to simplify the distribution of the base shear forces up the height of the structure and allows you because the structural system is fairly stiff and rigid and is not going to have much lateral deflection, uh, it allows you to avoid having to compute the structure's lateral deflection. It is not used very much, particularly in seismic design categories D, E, and F. 
ASCE 7 requires that structures be provided with, with sufficient strength to resist specified earthquake forces in combination with other loads. The specific load combinations are found in Chapter 2 of ASCE 7. The specified earthquake forces are typically lower than the forces that the design earthquake will actually cause in these structures. Uh, as I showed earlier, the required design strength is reduced from that force by the coefficient R. The magnitude of the specified forces and how they are determined depends on the seismic design category, the type of structure, and the type of element within the structure. We'll start with looking at the procedure for seismic design category A. As I said, structures that are assigned to seismic design category A are never expected to actually experience destructive ground shaking. Yet we want them to have minimum lateral strength and we want them to have minimum continuity forces uh, within the structures so that in the very rare event that they experience some ground shaking, or some other event, they won't shake apart. We don't actually design these structures for a, pick, for a specific spectral response acceleration. Instead, we design these structures so that they are capable of resisting minimum global seismic forces and continuity forces and wall anchorage forces. Specifically, we design structures in seismic design category A They can resist such that they can resist a lateral force equal to 1% of the structure's weight applied at each level of the structure. So in this two-story structure, we would apply first in the north-south direction, which I'll say is from lower left to right to upper right, 1% of the roof weight as a lateral force at the roof, 1% of the second story weight at the second floor level. And then we would also do a separate analysis where we do the same thing in the east-west direction. And again, this is to assure only that the structure has minimum structural integrity. We also require that each of the structure's independent parts be adequately tied together so that if shaking occurs, they won't fall off the structure. These are the so-called continuity or tie forces. Uh, ASCE 7 requires that structures in seismic design category A be connected together so that any piece of a structure, for example, a balcony off the side of the floor of this building, is tied to the main building structure with sufficient strength so that it can resist 5% of the weight of that piece applied as a lateral force to the piece. All concrete and masonry walls and seismic design category A structures must be connected to the floors and roofs that provide out of plane support for the wall uh, with minimum specified forces. Uh, these connections have to have a strength not less than 280 pounds per linear foot of wall. Uh, and the reason for this requirement is to prevent failures such as you see here. This is a reinforced concrete tilt up structure uh, that failed in the 1971 San Fernando earthquake in Southern California. Uh, this building had precast concrete wall panels and they were supported laterally by their connection to the wood roof. Uh, under the forces that occurred in the San Fernando earthquake, the walls experienced inertial forces that pushed them out of the plane. Some of those walls tore away from their connection to the roof and because they were supporting the roof, the roof just fell down when that occurred. And in some cases, a few of these panels actually laid flat down on the ground after the earthquake because they were no longer supported by the roof laterally at the top. This type of failure has happened to hundreds of buildings uh, in earthquakes since the 1964 uh, Prince William Sound earthquake near Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, and so even in seismic design category A, we require minimum connections of such heavy wall panels to flexible diaphragm roofs. For seismic design categories B through F, we're going to calculate seismic design forces that are based on the spectral response of these structures to the design spectra 
specified by AE7. The magnitude of the seismic forces is determined accounting for the structure's inelastic response indirectly using the R, C sub D, and omega zero coefficients I described earlier. In addition to designing for minimum lateral strength of the structure, in seismic design category B and above, we also design for vertical earthquake response. Uh, every structural element of a structure has to have the strength to resist a vertical seismic response force equal to 0.2 times the short period spectral design acceleration coefficient S sub DS times the dead weight supported by that element. And this applies to elements that are part of the seismic force resistance system and also the elements that are not part of the seismic force resistance system uh, and is intended to provide resistance to vertical earthquake shaking. Uh, these structural elements, the vertical earthquake forces have to be combined with dead and live loads according to the load combinations in chapter two of ASCE 7. In the higher seismic design categories, D, E, and F, system regularity and configuration become important considerations. ASE 7 attempts to encourage the design of structures with regular configurations. Structures that have regular configurations have a uniform distribution of mass, a uniform distribution of strength, a uniform distribution of stiffness, uh, and they have continuous structural systems. The reason ASCE 7 encourages this is because in past earthquakes we've seen in looking at damage that have occurred to buildings that various types of irregularities, including concentrations of mass, uh, soft stories, weak stories, and things of that nature, tend to result in a concentration of nonlinear response in the area of the irregularity. And that concentration of nonlinear response can result in damage that results in a loss of gravity load carrying capacity and collapse of the building. And so what ASCE 7 attempts to do is to encourage the designer to design structures that have uniform distributions of math, mass and strength and stiffness uh, so that when they respond to earthquakes, the amount of damage uh, doesn't concentrate in areas of irregularities, but rather is distributed throughout the structure so that the earthquake's energy can be dissipated in a benign manner. Some irregularities result in requirements to perform a more detailed analysis, for example, modal response spectrum analysis or linear or nonlinear response history analysis, simply because we believe that the equivalent lateral force technique does not adequately account for the difference in structural response created by these irregularities. Some irregularities result in portions of the structure having higher strength requirements to counter the effects of those irregularities. Uh, what we're seeing here uh, is the collapse of a building. Uh, it was a two-story wood frame apartment building in the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. This building was located in San Francisco. Uh, and it had what we call both a soft story and a weak story. The result of those irregularities is that when this building responded to the ground motion, which by the way, was only about half as intense as the design ground motion for this part of the city, uh, the damage consecrated, concentrated in that first story. Uh, the first story of the building saw extreme lateral displacement. Uh, and as a result, it collapsed the first story. Two basic categories of irregularity are defined in ASCE 7. These are horizontal irregularities that are associated with the distribution of seismic force resistance and plan, and vertical irregularities, which are associated with the distribution of stiffness and mass in elevation of the structure. Some of the horizontal irregularities that are considered by ASCE 7 are a torsional irregularity. Uh, torsional irregularities are often occur when structures have stiff elements, such as walls or brace frames, on one or two sides of the structure, but not on other sides of the structure. When this irregularity exists, in addition to translating in response to earthquake ground motions, these structures tend to twist. That twisting can significantly amplify 
uh, the amount of deformation demand and force on different elements of the structure and can cause concentrations of damage. Extreme torsional irregularities uh, occur when these types of configurations are extreme, as the name implies, and they are actually prohibited in some seismic design categories. This horizontal irregularity that you see here is called a reentrant corner irregularity. Uh, it results in poor performance because in response to ground shaking, the two wings of the structure can vibrate in different directions at the time and that can cause very large forces at these reentrant corners uh, and can cause damage, such as you see here. Another type of horizontal irregularity is called a diaphragm discontinuity. This is literally a large hole in the diaphragm, uh, which occurs in structures that have atria in them. Uh, also commonly occurs in industrial structures where there are mezzanines that occupy only a portion of the floor level. The significance of this horizontal irregularity uh, is that some portions of the structure can vibrate independently of other portions of the structure because they're not tied together uh, by the diaphragms with the rest of the structure. Uh, and also that the diaphragms can become somewhat flexible, resulting in unusual modes of vibration. Out of plane offset irregularities uh, occur when the size elements of the seismic force resisting system uh, vary in location from one level of a structure to another. The little cartoon that you see here on the left has a shear wall that comes down the exterior side of the building and then lands on the first, at the first story on columns of the building. Uh, the shear wall steps in a bay to provide an open air gallery. Uh, this is actually a fairly common feature in buildings for architectural purposes. Uh, and the building that you see in the middle photograph here, the Imperial County Services Building, it was a government building in Imperial County near San Diego in California. And that building experienced extreme damage to its columns due to crushing forces at that irregularity uh, during a 1979 earthquake that occurred in the, in the Imperial Valley. Uh, irregularities such as these are prohibited in some seismic design categories. And we also required prior design for ampli amplified seismic forces in elements like the columns beneath the discontinuous wall. Uh, those elements are required to be designed for forces that are amplified by the omega zero coefficient that I spoke to earlier. Another type of horizontal irregularity are so-called non-parallel systems uh, where the shear walls, brace frames, or moment frames that provide the seismic force resistance system are not located orthogonal to each other. Uh, what makes these types of structures special uh, is that the inclined lateral force resisting elements that you see, for example, in this triangular shape structure resist forces not only from north-south forces, but also from east-west forces. And so there are special rules for combination of forces from the two orthogonal directions of response for structures that have these non-parallel systems. Some common vertical irregularities are weak and soft stories, uh, very common because people like to have large door and window openings at the first story of structures and smaller window openings at larger, at upper levels of structures. This is a picture of the olive, the old Olive View Hospital in San Fernando, California, after the San Fernando earthquake. Uh, you can see that just like the cartoon of the structure I showed in the last slide, this structure had many windows in the ground story. Uh, it also had a somewhat taller story in the ground story than it did in the stories above. The result of that was that it had both a weak and soft story and experienced a concentration of damage in that weak and soft story, which is why this type of irregularity is discouraged. And you can see here the types of damage that occurred in the columns in that weak story. Another type of vertical irregularity is the in-plane discontinuity irregularity. This occurs when the lateral force resisting system is not set back in plan 
but is set back along a similar line of framing. So for example, in this brace frame structure to the right, in the top story, the brace frame is in the extreme right-hand bay, and in adjacent in lower stories, it's in the central bay. Uh, in structures of this type, it's important to recognize the large seismic forces that it can occur in the elements beneath that discontinued brace frame. Uh, the shear wall structure shown here on the left uh, has a significant reduction in the width of the lateral force resisting system. Uh, and what that does it, is it can tend, can cause this structure to become much more flexible where the narrower shear walls are than it is in the lower stories, which can cause the whipping type forces in the more flexible upper structure. Uh, and it's important to assure that those types of forces are accounted for in the design. The procedure for determining the design forces on a structure are first to determine the design based shear force represented by the symbol V in this cartoon, and then to distribute that base shear force up to the various levels of the structure in the form of story forces. And that distribution is made according to the weight of the structure and its deflected shape. The seismic base shear force V is determined as the seismic base shear coefficient C sub S times the seismic weight of the building W. The building seismic weight includes the dead load of all of the structural and non-structural elements in the building, including fixed partitions. In areas that can receive heavy snow loads, a portion of the snow load also needs to be considered in the in the building seismic weight W. And in occupancies associated with storage, such as warehouses uh, that have heavy live loads, a portion of the live load needs to be considered as well. The base shear force for the structure is, is dependent on the structure's fundamental period, its risk category, the structural system used. Uh, the equivalent lateral force technique is used to define the value of the C sub S coefficient, uh, and it's based on the two-period response spectrum that I talked to earlier. Uh, the C sub S coefficient will be the lesser of S sub DS divided by R over I, and that represents structures that have periods on the plateau of the spectrum, or S sub D1, divided by R over I and T, which represents structures on the descending hyperbolic portion of the response spectrum. And so you compute those two equations uh, and take the lesser of those two as being the base shear coefficient. For structures with a fundamental period of vibration greater than the transition period T sub L, uh, you can use the lesser value of those two or that associated with this equation here, which is simply the geometric equation for that descending branch of the line shown in red there. Regardless of the value of the base shear coefficient computed by any of those three equations, no structure can be designed for a base shear coefficient less than 0.44 S sub DS times the occupancy importance factor I. Uh, and I'd again like to point out that in these base shear equations here, you'll note that the response modification coefficient R is re reduced by the value of the occupancy importance factor I. For risk category one and two structures, I has a value of 1.0. For risk category three structures, I has a value of 1.25. And for risk category four structures, I has a value of 1.5. So if you're designing a risk category four structure, you're designing it for 33% more strength than a risk category two structure, basically limiting the amount of ductility that will be required of the structure in an earthquake. In near fault conditions, and there was a question about near fault conditions earlier, in near fault conditions, uh, you're in seismic design category E and F, uh, and there is another minimum base shear equation given by 0.5 S sub one divided by R over I, 
Uh, and this phase shear equation relates to the potential to have impulsive type ground motion that will produce very large spectral response parameters out to very long periods. Once you've determined the base shear force for the structure, you distribute the force up laterally uh, up to the different levels of the structure using the formula that you see here. And what this formula is, is an approximation of the mode shape for the building, the fundamental mode shape of the building. Uh, and so the base shear force at each level is given by the weight at that level times the height of that level above the base of the structure divided by the sum of the weight of each level times the height of each level of the base of the base of the structure raised to a coefficient k uh, times the total base shear force v. Uh, those of you familiar with structural dynamics will recognize this equation as related to the equation for the modal shape participation factor that you can compute in response spectrum analysis. In addition to assuring that the structure has adequate strength, that its yield strength will not be less than the required base shear force, deflections of structure must be checked if the simplified analysis procedure is not used. The deflection checks are used to make sure that the structure doesn't drift too much in response to ground shaking, uh, that the check that the structure can remain stable, uh, and that if structure is left next to another structure, it won't pound into that adjacent structure and cause damage. Uh, to do this, we use the parameter called story drift. Story drift is the difference between the def lateral deflection of the building at one level relative to that at the level below divided by the story height. In this cartoon here, the third story drift would be simply the drift at the third at the at the roof compared to the drift at the second level divided by the height of that third story. The allowable story drift depends on the type of structural system used and the risk category. For risk category three and four structures, we limit the allowable story drift more than we do for risk category two structures, so as to reduce the damage to non-structural components and also structural components. We check the drift not at the level that, that occurs in response to the design seismic forces, but at a level that is amplified by the coefficient C sub D, uh, which is determined from table 12.2.1 and approximates the real nonlinear response of the structure. This slide here illustrates what happens when pounding occurs. Uh, the structure on the right that you see here uh, collapsed. It was a little bit taller than the structure on the left because the two structures had different periods. They vibrated out of phase in response to the earthquake. They vibrated apart, and then they vibrated together. Uh, and basically the roof of the structure on the left gave a karate chop to the structure on the right. And as a result of that created additional forces that the structure was not adequate to resist. Uh, and the structure folded over on top of the structure on the left. Uh, to avoid that from happening, ASCE 7 requires that adjacent structures be separated sufficiently so that they not pound into each other when responding to design earthquake ground shaking. We're also required to check the stability of structures, that is their ability to remain stable when they're displaced laterally. Uh, to do that, we compute the quantity theta shown here, Theta is equal to the weight of the structure above the story under, that's being checked times the expected interstory drift of the structure divided by the shear in that story, the height of the story, and the deflection amplification coefficient C sub D. If this deflection, if this theta coefficient is less than 0.1, the structure is considered stable. Uh, if it exceeds 0.25, the structure is considered unstable. Uh, and if it's between 0.1 and 0.25, you have to consider uh, second order effects when computing the forces in the structure that directly consider the, the structure's displacement when considering when determining the forces. In seismic design categories D, E, and F, uh, consideration of the strength of the structure must also include a check on the structure's redundancy. 
Redundancy is considered sufficient if removal of any one element in the structure does not reduce the lateral of the strength of the structure by more than one third, create an extreme torsional irregularity. Uh, and if the structure does not meet these redundancy requirements, its strength must be increased by 30%. And the reason for this redundancy requirement is simply that we are designing our structures with the expectation that they will be damaged. If there are only a few elements in the structure that are providing lateral resistance uh, and those are damaged, the probability that the structure will collapse increases. And so we try to provide more elements with the expectation that will result in less damage to the various elements and that there will be a lower probability of losing so much strength that the structure collapses. Once the structure has been proportioned so that it has adequate stiffness and adequate strength, then ASCE 7 refers you to the material standards, ACI 318, the National Design Specification, the Masonry Standard, uh, AISE 341, for criteria on how to detail the structure. Shown here are some of the detailing requirements for special coupled ductile reinforced concrete shear walls on the left and special moment resisting frames on the right. Uh, each named structural system has special detailing requirements associated with that system uh, that are very important to achieving the ductility assumed in assignment of the R, C sub D and omega zero coefficients in table 12.2.1. If you want to learn more on these topics, uh, you can go to the material standards. Uh, you can go to the NEHRP recommended provisions for seismic regulation of buildings and other structures, which serves as the basis for the ASCE 7 seismic design criteria. Uh, and you can also look at FEMA P749 itself, which this seminar is providing training on. So I'll stop there, if there and ask if there are any questions. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you so much, Ronald, for, for this great uh, webinar. Um, on behalf of SLC, I would like to thank you. And uh, uh, there are a lot of messages for you in the chat from all around the world, thanking you for giving this opportunity to everyone to listen to you. Um, so there's a question regarding the the base your coefficient C sub S, uh, how did we determine that it should be greater than 0.44 times the seismic design, uh, the spectral uh, design force? I know what you're saying. It's an excellent question and there's actually yeah. a somewhat embarrassing answer to that. Uh, way back in 1933, there was an earthquake in Long Beach, California that was highly destructive of a number of buildings, uh, and in particular, a number of school buildings that were constructed of unreinforced masonry. That, in response to the damage that occurred in that earthquake, the state of California adopted a couple of bills. Uh, one of them was called the Riley Act. The Riley Act did two things. One is it prohibited further use of unreinforced masonry construction in California. The second thing it did is it established a minimum requirement for every building in California to be designed for a minimum of 3% of the weight of the building as a lateral force. That 0.44 S sub D S I equation is basically that 3% design requirement modified to convert from allowable stress design to strength design, which happened some 20 years ago. The forces got increased by a factor of 1.4. And considering the average spectral design acceleration in coastal California of 1G. So if you work backwards, you could get back to a 3% allowable stress design, minimum base shear requirement. It has stayed in the building code because the Riley Act is still the law in California. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's, I think, a great answer. This information is not available, like, anywhere, I think. No, only old people like me know that, know that yeah. story. <laughs> uh, so there's one more question regarding the, the usage of flat slab. So the attendee is asking uh, whether we can use a flat slab 
as a gravity for just for the gravity load and uh, for the lateral load resisting system can we use shear wall and perimeter beams uh, according to them like flat slab is not permitted uh, in seismic design category C, D, and F. That, that's correct. So, so flat slab systems without other means of seismic force resistance systems, brace frames, shear walls, moment frames, are not permitted in higher seismic design categories. Uh, and that's because flat slab systems that have been constructed in the past and have been subjected to severe earthquake shaking uh, have frequently suffered what's called a punching shear failure, where basically a circular shear failure occurs around the perimeter of the column, basically detaching the floor slab from the column uh, and allowing the floor slab to fall onto the floor below. Uh, in fact, in the 1994 Northridge earthquake, there was a rather striking example of that behavior in a May Company department store at Topanga Plaza. Uh, in the San Fernando Valley. Fortunately, that earthquake happened at five in the morning. No one was in that department store. But if it had happened midday, perhaps, when there were both salespeople and customers in the store, every one of them would have perished in that building. And so for that reason, that system is not permitted uh, unless there is a stiffer lateral force resisting system present as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, we we are done with the questions. And uh, uh, with that, I would uh, uh, just hand it over to Elizabeth for the closing remarks. Okay. And, and just one more thing before Elizabeth speaks. I, I actually took longer to present this than I was hoping to. There are actually a few more things I did want to present. I had a, a brief section on design of the anchorage of non-structural components. Uh, I also had a section on performance-based design and the use of seismic isolation uh, and energy dissipation systems as a means of providing better performance in structures. Uh, I wish I would have had the time to talk to you about those because obviously from the questions, there is some interest uh, in the group uh, in better performing structures, and those are good ways to achieve that. So I encourage you all to download FEMA P749 when it becomes available and to read through that, uh, and also to visit the sections in ASCE 7 that speak to those technologies. And with that, I'll thank you for your attendance and your attention. Ron, if you do want to take another five to 10 minutes to go over those slides, we can do that. I'll leave it up to you. Yeah, I, I think actually it would probably take me more time to do that than I have available. So I think we ought to probably stop it at this point. And that's a good note to me to, look to shorten some of the some of the slides in this presentation going forward. All right, well, thank you so much. I'm just gonna share my screen again briefly. So thank you everyone for attending today. You'll receive a post webinar survey by email. Please take the time to fill this out if you can. That will be very helpful to us here at ERI, but also to ATC and FEMA in designing future trainings like these. If you'd like to learn more about ERI, you can check out our website here and um, see the benefits of becoming a member and how to do so. To learn more about our upcoming webinars, you can also check out our Pulse newsletter, um, which is available to members by email and also visible on the website. Finally, I just want to um, thank FEMA for helping support webinars like these and also ERI members themselves uh, whose support and membership allow us to put on events like this. Thank you again for attending um, and please keep an eye out on our YouTube channel for recording of this event. You can also contact us by email for the slides if you'd like them.